Thank you and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On September 11, 2001, the world tingled as we pricked up our ears and listened to the shocking news bulletins coming out of New York City. And then from the Pentagon, Washington, D.C., as the newscaster said, terrorists hijacked planes, the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center, and the Pentagon. It was like a plot from some horror movie. What kind of people would do something like this? And we thought, what if I had been on one of those planes? Jeannie's mother was flying out from Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C. to the West Coast that very morning. And you'll all remember that when the attack hit in New York, all flights were immediately grounded. Where was mother? We knew our little 86-year-old Evelyn had landed somewhere in the country, but where, where was she? I don't know, Jeannie, four, five, six, seven, eight hours went by. We worried, and what relief when we finally discovered that her plane had landed in Kansas City. But tonight, we're still reeling in shock from the aftermath of the attack on America. You know, suddenly the flight on planet Earth has gotten a whole lot more bumpy, hasn't it? Anthrax, jihad, words we didn't know two years ago. The world tonight is on tiptoe. Wall Street is holding its breath. The fuse is lit and burning, and everyone is watching the Middle East, wondering something is coming, something of epic proportions. Our worried world waits. In fact, the pundits now say that our future is so frightening that something greater than man, a power above man, outside man, must alter the collision course that our great nations are now taking. But ladies and gentlemen, during this very program tonight, it is my purpose to actually identify this needed force so that from now on, you'll be able to read your newspaper with a brand new perspective and see world events in a brand new light. You tonight are on the verge of a truly thrilling discovery. Now, strange as it might seem, to properly identify this power, it's necessary to go back in history 2,600 years and take a look at one of the shrewdest cartoons of world history ever produced. And no wonder God himself produced it and designed it. I want you to go back with me tonight to the splendors of an ancient eastern palace, where in one night a great world monarch had a most remarkable dream. We find that recorded in the book of Daniel, chapter 2. Now, this dazzling young monarch just happens to be Saddam Hussein's hero. Maybe you read it in Time magazine a couple of years. By the way, today is Saddam Hussein's birthday. He's 66. Nebuchadnezzar is that king that Saddam Hussein has patterned his whole life after. He was the king of ancient Babylon who'd forged together that great world empire, Babylon. Determined to establish an eternal dynasty, he even went to the pains of stamping his own name on every single brick that they used in the construction of Babylon. By the way, if you win the prize on Jeopardy or the Wheel of Fortune and you would happen to be sent over to Baghdad next week, did you know that tourists can still buy an original brick from ancient Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar's name stamped on it? I mean, that proud monarch was determined Babylon would always rule the world. That's why Saddam likes him as his alter ego. And thinking of his empire to come, one night King Nebuchadnezzar fell asleep and he dreamed a dream, verse 1 says in Daniel chapter 2, and in that dream, the Bible says he saw terrible things. He saw rise and fall of political empires crashing one after another. And in his terror, he awakened and he cried out in that palace bedroom. And his Taliban guards and aides and the Secret Service agents came rushing in. What is it, King? What is it? Oh, oh, I've, I've had a dream, awful dream. Terrifying things are about to come. It's so ominous. I, I feel sick. Well, what is it? Tell us. The king said, quick, call the wise men, the astrologers. In the ancient days, dreams were very important to them, so fortune tellers were employed to foretell the future. So here they came, the brain's trust of the empire. Some of them were mathematicians, astronomers, scientists, all with their fancy degrees and PhDs and 
fiddly dees. Lechonomancy, belomancy, necropis, hepatoscopy. And they said, what is it? What is a king? And Daniel 2 verse 3 says, oh, I've had a dream. And my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Now mind you, these men were like our 21st century Harvard graduates. They were Wall Street's market analysts. In Daniel 2 verse 4, they said, O oh, king, your majesty, live forever. Now you just go ahead, tell us your dream, and we'll give you the interpretation. The king said, now listen, that's the very point. I've forgotten the dream. You divines, you claim to have some direct communication with the gods. You tell me my dream. And verses 5 and 6 record the desperate struggle between the so-called wise men, who everybody could see now were clearly stalling for time, and the king, who demanded, my decision is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. Oh, come on, king. Just tell us a little bit of the dream. You tell me the dream or I'll have the whole bunch of you religious hypocrites killed. Oh, king, verses 10 and 11 says, there, there's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. And they were right. No king or lord or ruler has ever asked anything of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. They said, no, there's no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. And the king roars, slay them all, execute every last one of them. Daniel chapter 2 verse 13, it says, so the decree went out and they began killing the wise men. But now at the court of Babylon during this very time happened to live the young God-fearing Jewish prophet by the name of Daniel. And he has three companions, we know them by name, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had been captured by Nebuchadnezzar's armies during one of its campaigns against Jerusalem, and so they were now prisoners of war, POWs. But because of their superior IQ, they weren't made slaves or killed in genocide. These three Hebrews and Daniel were training as future aides for the king. I don't know why, but for some reason Daniel and his three friends hadn't been called in for Nebuchadnezzar's midnight madness con consultation. So when the attorney general, whose name was Arioch, and his soldiers came to arrest Daniel, the Bible tells us that this winsome young man Daniel responded with very gracious tact. Arioch, uh, we're friends. I mean, this, this seems very harsh and abrupt. That's unlike the king. What's the matter? Well, Daniel, I'm very sorry, kind of in a hurry, but I guess the king had too much pizza last night. Daniel 2, 24 says, Daniel says, well, but, but don't, don't destroy the wise men of Babylon. If you'll just grant a temporary stay of execution and then take me to the king, Arioch, both the dream and the interpretation can be made known to the king. It's a very fascinating drama that unfolds here as the king actually grants Daniel's request and Daniel heads home and he spends the entire night in prayer with his companions. But that night, that very night, God revealed the secret dream to him in a vision. And the next morning, Daniel calls Arioch on his cell phone, if he had one, Daniel 2.24. Arioch, don't execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king and I will interpret his dream for him. Can you see Daniel getting up, putting on his tails and bow tie or whatever he wore back then? But he steps into the throne room, and the king, he's already heard a little bit about this, and he flatters Daniel, and he says, Well, young man, Daniel, I understand you're pretty wise, pretty smart. You're able to tell me what I dra dreamed. Oh, just a minute, says Daniel. I want you to know I didn't come up with this. Notice tw verses 27 and 28. The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what? What will be in the latter days? Amen. King, when it comes to foretelling the future, the brain's trust of your empire, of mankind, is like Enron and Worldcom. But, O oh, king, God has taken this occasion to outline through your dream 
the history of the world for more than 2,600 years. Really, the king says? He leans forward on his throne. Go ahead, Daniel. What did I see? And he listens intently as loudly and clearly Daniel begins to speak in verse 29 of Daniel chapter 2. Your majesty, as for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while you're on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. Well, yes, Daniel, go ahead. What did I dream? Verse 31, you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, this image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. That's where the kids get that term, awesome. Oh, Daniel, yes, yes, that's it, an awesome image. This image's head was of gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of brass, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And amazed, Nebuchadnezzar listens, Danny, Danny boy, you got it. Yes, you got it again. That's just as I saw it. Verses 34 and 35, Daniel continues, You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. That's right, says the king. That dream, it ended with that mysterious stone hurtling out of somewhere in space and it struck that image on its feet and just shattering it, grinding the whole statue to powder so that it was so fine the wind just blew it away. Verse 35, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel looks at the king. The king's looking back at Daniel. He's still leaning forward on the edge of his throne. And his face kind of brightens and he says, Yes, that's it. That's the dream, exactly as I saw it. Amazing. And it's all coming back now, every detail. This metal man, each different metal, less in value, is descend from the head to the toe. There's gold, and then there's silver, then brass, then iron, then iron mixed with clay. Perhaps someone, though, asks tonight, but what possible significance can this obscure 2,600-year-old dream have upon today's news or Iraq? Ah, oh, my friend, wrapped up in this strange image are hidden certain salient facts that are capable of transforming our entire outlook on the future. Oh, you say, well, what does it mean? That is the question Nebuchadnezzar asked and said the young prophet in verse 36, this is the dream. Now, we will tell the interpretation. Now, please, friend, notice, I'm not going to place some modern interpretation on this musty old dream. It was interpreted for us on the spot 2,500 years ago. Amen. So again, the king nervously changes his position on his throne, and, and he listens as in just a few words, God sketched history from Babylon's time 600 years before Christ, to the final climax of Earth's history. And Daniel looks squarely at King Nebuchadnezzar, ruler of this world's first universal kingdom, and he declares, Your Majesty, here's what this dream means. Verse 38, You, O King, are this head of gold. Babylon. Oh, the king smiles. That's fine. Babylon the golden. That fits. Babylon the Great. The king was thrilled to think that he was at the top of that image. Babylon was the golden kingdom of a golden age. And in fact, you look into history and you find that they used gold everywhere. When you went to school, you learned that the fabulous hanging gardens of Babylon were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. They had 150 foot wide streets, all paved, crisscrossing each other at right angles. In fact, they had a subterranean tunnel underneath the Euphrates River. That's where Saddam got that idea of all those tunnels. And it was connecting two of the royal palaces way back then. They had a food supply on hand for 20 years in case of enemy attack. Babylon the Golden, Babylon the Impregnable. 
They would never fail. They were eternal. They thought. As Daniel talked, the king was really enjoying the thought of his supremacy up there at the top, his head of gold. All this fits, Daniel. I'm that head of gold. Why don't you just go right on with this wonderful forecast? Verse 39, Daniel said, But king, after you will arise another kingdom inferior to you. What? Come on, let me get real. An inferior kingdom conquer Babylon and rule the world? It, it cannot be. Never will an inferior kingdom tumble Babylon and rule the world. But archaeologists have excavated clay tablets inscribed with some pretty pompous words by Nebuchadnezzar, and this is actually from history. I'm quoting. The fortification of Esagala and Babylon, I strengthened and established the name of my reign forever. And that is precisely why Saddam Hussein once said to the press, Nebuchadnezzar is my hero because no one will ever take Baghdad. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says that proud Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, verse 30, spoke saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? But God's holy word said that another power would achieve world supremacy and supersede the golden kingdom of Babylon. In fact, God's word even identified that next power for Daniel. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 20, in chapter 5, 28, God names this power as Medo-Persia. Did this happen? If you know world history, you know that it did. In fact, Daniel lived long enough to see it happen. But history tells us that it was an unusual dual power, an empire. Well, how did that happen? It happened during the reign of Belshazzar, who was the very arrogant and proud, proud grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Cyrus the Mede, he laid siege to Babylon, but the Babylonians scoffed. They had a walls 387 feet high and 87 feet thick. They scoffed at those armies of Cyrus gathered outside the walls of Babylon. No problem. There was no way Babylon could fall. But God said, Babylon would succumb to a lesser nation. In fact, it predicted that Cyrus would do the work. How? By strategy. History tells us on October 13, 539 B.C., that that great golden kingdom of Babylon came crashing down and it collapsed in just one night. How? Well, God had prophesied it. 200 years before, through the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 45, verse 1, thus says the Lord God to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings to open before him, notice, the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. Now, prophecy revealed that Cyrus would do this a hundred years, 150 years before he was even born. But how would he do it? Well, Cyrus could not break down those great big walls, so he did an amazing thing. It sounds very, very simple now, but nobody had ever heard of it before. But the river Euphrates was the key. History tells us that Cyrus sent his engineers to work upstream on the Euphrates River, and they built some dams and dikes to divert the river that ran right through the center of the city, and on a given night, on a given signal, one group of those soldiers and engineers turned aside that whole Euphrates River. It dropped down to a trickle, and so the rest of the army that were hiding in ambush, they tramped down into the riverbed, marched underneath the great walls of Babylon, right into the city, and they had left those two double doors open inside the city, and that night, by surprise attack, the Persian army stormed Belshazzar's palace. They captured the city. They killed the king, and Babylon the Golden crashed in one night. So now Medo-Persia ruled the world. For two centuries, from 539 to 331 B.C., the chest and arms of silver of that great image ruled a kingdom that certainly was a whole lot inferior to Babylon. But it happened, and history confirms it. 
But you see, the prophecy goes on, and history goes on. Daniel predicted the kingdom of silver would also fall. Notice verse 39. Next, O king, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Well, did that come to pass? I mean, could Daniel have possibly identified this third world power when it hardly even existed yet? In Daniel 8, 21, he puts it down in black and white. The belly and thighs of bronze made on this metal image is Greece, and he even names it 300 years before it arose. Daniel spelled it out, one, two, three. First Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Grecia. And history backs up the Bible. The fantastic story of Alexander the Great, the dazzling young general who marched his armies so fast that the Bible says like his feet seemed like they touched not the ground. Jeannie and I were in Greece with Phil Draper and some of our Voice of Prophecy team just a little over a year ago before everything uh, blew up. Two summers ago, we were following the journeys of the Apostle Paul, and our guide in near Athens showed us the exact place where Alexander and the Greeks collided head-on with Darius III of Persia in the Battle of Arbella in 331 B.C. And they showed us that little area in, in, in the ocean there in, in uh, the Mediterranean where the, he said there were so many Persian ships packed into that little bay, they couldn't maneuver, they couldn't turn around. Alexander just had some little tiny rowboats practically. His ragtag band of just 47,000 soldiers were pitted against one million Persians. Impossible? Jimmy the Greek, the odds maker in Vegas, would say, uh, -uh that's 20 to 1 odds, no way. But Daniel chapter 6 says, no, the Greeks will tumble the Medo-Persian Empire. And it happened. It happened. At the young age of 25, Alexander became the ruler over the most expensive and extensive world empire that it had ever known, Greece, the great bronze third world empire. You know, if you read world history, and I took history as a minor in college, it's very interesting to read Arian, who writes this, and I'm quoting. He writes about Alexander. I am persuaded that there was no nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. There seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding both over his birth and actions. Greece, the kingdom of brass. Now, I don't believe it was just coincidence that the Greek soldiers wore brass armor, brass spears, brass helmets, brass shields, brass battle axes, because that was the third metal of that empire in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And Alexander the Great, what a general. I mean, in five short years, he marched his armies all over the globe. He crossed the Himalayas to India. And finally, at just 32 years of age, Alexander sat down and he wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. A bloodthirsty and licentious soldier he was, Alexander often killed his own friends for sport in his drunken frenzies. Or he'd burn down beautiful palaces simply to watch them burn. He was a pyromaniac. Unfortunately, Alexander the Great dropped dead one day of acute alcoholism. And after his death, the Greek Empire went downhill fast until on June 22, 168 B.C., at the Battle of Pinda, perished the great empire of Alexander the Great just 144 years after his death. But God predicted four world empires, one after the other. So after those thighs of brass, we're down now in the legs of iron. Notice verse 40 of Daniel 2. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. Well, turning to history again, sure enough, Rome crushed Grecia. Rome was the most fierce and ruthless kingdom yet. This great iron monarchy with her Caesars who called themselves gods and demanded worship. Everyone knows that Rome was the cruel power that put Jesus to death. Roman soldiers nailed him to the cross on Calvary. Iron Rome, military Rome, characterized by rumbling iron chariots, short iron 
swords and fantastic highway systems, but Rome was a horribly fierce, authoritative power. Daniel speaks again. But now listen, King. King, here we're down in the legs, but now a major change in world history is coming. Your Majesty, there's not going to be any more world empires that follow Rome. What? No more world empires? There's always world empires. No fifth empire, Daniel? No, says Daniel. Prophecy says the fourth world empire is the very last. Babylon the Golden, Medo-Persia, Grecia, then the Iron Monarchy of Rome, but then God says a big change is coming. Well, Nebuchadnezzar leans forward on his throne, listening to Daniel as he points now down to the feet of that great image. King, do you remember that you saw in your dream a great breakup? You remember the feet were part of iron and part of clay? Yes. What does that mean? Verse 41, verse 42 and 3. King, just as you saw that the feet were part of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be now a divided kingdom. So the people will be a mixture and not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. Well, now, Danny boy, do you mean to tell me that there will not be one world empire anymore? Exactly, King. No fifth world empire. Rome would rule the world for 600 years, but then it would disintegrate. Did it happen? Did it? You just go down the street here to any Barnes and Noble store, and you read Edward Gibbon's The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. Probably many of you have it at home. Probably haven't read it. It's pretty heavy stuff. The Gibbons tells us that Rome did divide and break up, just like those ten toes. Daniel 7.24 said, ten kings would arise. In fact, Gibbons tells how Rome imploded and collapsed through vice, through luxury, through political corruption, scandal, and particularly moral decay. We talk about those Roman orgies. This is what we're talking about. It caved in, becoming an easy prey for those barbarian tribes that began to invade the empire around 476 over those alpine passes to the north. They swarmed in from northern Europe in full revolt. They deposed Emperor Augustus, and Rome just fractured into segments. Little nations, little countries, corresponding exactly to the ten toes in the image that came apart, the iron clay. And they can't mix. Nothing you can do welds iron to clay. So Daniel 2, verses 42 and 43 says, So the kingdom now will be partly strong, partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here tonight to tell you that in history, we here are right down there in the toes of that great big image. Those barbarian divisions around 476 A.D. basically became the nations of what we now call today modern Europe. In fact, if you went to public high school or college, you know that historians list these ten barbaric tribes but put them on the chart here right now. The Alamanni became the Germans, the Burgundians became the Swiss, the Franks became the French, the Lombards are the Italians, the Saxons are the English, the Suevi are the Portuguese, the Visigoths are our Spanish friends, and the Heruli and the Ostrogoths and the Vandals are now extinct. But here's the point. God predicted these nations of Europe and that they would never unite. They'll try. Daniel 2.43 says, they will mingle themselves with the seed of men. In other words, they would intermarry, royalty. But that won't work. And you know, you look at the history of Europe. Fascinating to me. Connie went to school over there in England, and you can probably verify this. They tried everything you can to get Europe together. They tried intermarriage. They tried intrigue. They tried alimony. They tried palimony. But God said no. They'll try, but you read the text with me. What does your Bible say? They shall not cleave one to another. They would fail. Seven words 
in verse 43 spell the doom of all future attempts for world dominion. I mean, they tried forging one world empire down to the Middle Ages, clear into the 20th century. In fact, now in the 21st century, they've even come up with some new ways of trying to bring them together. They have one of them called the European Common Market. In fact, they have a new common currency. They kind of like it. The euro seems to be about the best attempt they've ever had. But is it all working? No. They're still divided, perhaps more than ever. Intermarriage, divorce, remarriage, adultery, incest, intrigue, you name it, went on in Europe. And suddenly, as you look at world history, all of the political rulers began to be related to each other. So what happens? World War I was just one great big family quarrel. Most of the rulers of Europe were related in some way to Christian IX of Denmark. Same with World War II over there in Europe. Same story. Another family argument, as far as Europe was concerned. The Tsar of Russia, the King of England, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, they were all first cousins related to Queen Victoria, their grandmother. By the way, if you ever do get the courage to fly on an airline again and go over to Europe, and you go to Denmark, be sure to go to the palace. And you'll see a famous picture there with the family tree of the royal families of Europe and it will show you that they were all related. You see, they hoped by somehow maybe romancing each other, marrying each other, that it would bring them together and prevent wars. Well, it didn't. It's never worked because God predicted they could not stick together, just as iron and clay will not stick together. Everyone tried to glue the nations of Europe together. Charlemagne in 800, tried. He was defeated. Charles V of Spain, he tried it. Defeated. Louis XIV of France, defeated. Napoleon, defeated. In fact, Napoleon finally admitted, God is just too much for me. Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, defeated. Hitler in 1939, defeated. Mussolini, defeated because a single verse of prophecy spelled the doom of all of these efforts to unite Europe under one flag. God said, they shall not cleave one to another. Amen. I'm a Canadian by birth and all of my Canadian friends are listening tonight. We have a French translator and they're sending it up to Montreal and all the French Canada. You know, I was fascinated this last summer when they had that big G8 summit conference up there in Kananaskis, Alberta. That's right inside Banff National Park. Do you remember who was there on June 6, 2002? President Bush was there. Tony Blair was there from Canada. England, France, they were all there trying to bring world peace in Europe. Peace in the Middle East. Now, I'm a good citizen. I don't wish to be disrespectful or unpatriotic. But ladies and gentlemen, these seven words spell the ultimate doom of the United Nations, the League of Nations, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, the Organization of American States, the Palestinian-Israeli Peace Accord. The Bible says they shall not cleave one to another. Whether it's in Moscow or Beijing or the White House, they may get together. But the Bible says they can't stick together. It will never be. And those words, those same words, they hang over every peace table, every council of nations, every effort toward uniting the world in peace. God said, you say it with me. Say it right out loud so they can hear you in Paradise, California, where my folks are listening tonight. Everyone. They shall not cleave one to another. So ladies and gentlemen, the question we ask here in this Voice of Prophecy Speaks series is what's next? That's the question tonight. And the Voice of Prophecy speaks again. Because suddenly the prophet stops short and he says, Oh, look there, king. Do you see it coming? The king looks up as though he sees something. Do you see it? That stone cut out without hands and it comes down and strikes the image upon the feet and smashes all those nations to bit and, and, and the image explodes and shatters in a billion pieces and that stone just grinds it to power and blows it away. Well, the king watches as that stone, sure enough, grows until it becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. Daniel, what does that mean? What is that stone? What does it represent? Ah, he hears the pronouncement in verse 44 and 45. 
in the time of those kings, down in the feet of iron mixed with clay, of modern Europe and the United States of America, in those days, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to other people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to the end. But it itself will endure forever. Amen. King, this is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. King, the dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. Amen. My friends tonight, Daniel 2 is a picture of tomorrow morning's newspaper headlines. That the great next event on the stage of human history is the kingdom of the stone, the second coming of Jesus. That's what's next. That stone cut out without hands means that God's kingdom won't be founded by the hands of men, but by the mighty hand of God. And it is a kingdom that will fill the whole earth when that hallelujah chorus that we sing every Christmas will fill the prophecy of Revelation chapter 11 verse 15 that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and He shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Amen. Daniel 2 is a panoramic picture of history in advance for our benefit. And you and I tonight have been permitted to peek behind the curtain of time and see the continued struggle that's gone on for thousands of years from Daniel's time clear down to the establishment of Christ's kingdom and we see whose side will win soon what's next Christ's kingdom the very next event not the Taliban not Osama bin Laden not atheism no listen we tonight pardon my expression here we're living down in the very tippy toenails of that image. Amen. It's almost over. Amen. Very soon now, the great majesty of heaven will arise and he'll step across the threshold of time and he'll see our seething, war-torn planet and he'll say, ladies and gentlemen, it's closing time. Things have gone on far enough. The wisdom and brain's trust of humankind is bankrupt. It's over. But permit me to ask you a question tonight. Whether you're watching in the Australian Pacific Rim, or you are in Papua New Guinea, which we have watching tonight, or you're in South America, or in Canada, or the islands of the sea, wherever you're listening tonight, I have a question for you. Friend, listen carefully. If all of these predictions in just one chapter of the Bible are absolutely correct in every detail, tracing thousands of years of history in advance, can't we trust the rest of the Bible too? Can we rely on other truths in God's Word that are given to guide and help us prepare for that coming kingdom? Can't we tonight be absolutely certain Jesus really is coming a second time? Soon, just as this prophecy in Daniel 2 says. I believe with all of my heart that tonight we are living on borrowed time. We're right down there in the toes on the very verge of God's eternal kingdom. We've come to the end. The next move isn't man's. It's God's. Let me say it this way. Maybe there's not going to be any more Voyager spacecraft invasions into space. Folks, we're about to witness a great big invasion from space. But think, in loving mercy, God reveals step by step exactly what's coming so that we can face the future not with fear, but with confidence. And our business tonight, friend, is to determine that we're going to be a citizen of the eternal kingdom that's coming. And folks, we can. We must through the wonderful citizenship freely offered through Jesus' blood-stained cross on Calvary. You know, God is making up His kingdom. He's deciding right now who's going to be in that kingdom. 
Friend, you did not come to this meeting by accident. I believe you're here by divine appointment. He's inviting you today to come. Get out your Bibles. Bring them with you. Study. Open your mind to God's plan for your future. What's next? What's next, friend, is the choice is up to you. Will you ponder with me these words from Joey's song? Are you ready for Jesus to come? The theme of the Bible is Jesus and how he died to save men. The plan of salvation assures us he's coming back again. Are you faithful in all that you do? Have you fought a good fight? Have you stood for the right? Have others seen Jesus in you? Are you ready to stand in your place? Are you ready to look in his face? Can you look up and say, this is my Lord? Are you ready for Jesus? join me in prayer just now eternal God thank you for the dramatic picture of truth in Daniel 2 for the certainty of these words in this amazing dream and Lord we really do want to be citizens of that eternal kingdom of the stone we do while our heads are bowed and we're in an attitude of prayer the head of each row, there are row captains, and I'd like them to hand down right now to each row a little container. Just pass that down quickly. Row captains, just now, send it down. Take one of those little response cards and a pencil if you need it. Just take it out and pass it to the person next to you. Everyone, just do that right now. Pass it right down. Thank you, row captains. And our heads are bowed in prayer. I want to just pray, Lord, Right now, I want to invite any person in this auditorium or wherever they're listening across this great globe. I want them to consider being in that kingdom. And Lord, to seriously explore how we can be citizens. Jesus is inviting us personally. Jesus is present whenever his word is preached and his holy word is lifted up. So he's here, King of kings, Lord of lords, right now. Well, Lord, if a world president walked into this room right now, we'd all stand in honor and respect. But Jesus is here. So we want to honor you, respect you, and choose you. We want to be a citizen in your kingdom. So, friend, wherever you're listening tonight, I hope you have that card now in your hand. And with your head bowed, I'd like to invite you, if you'd like to begin putting your faith more firmly into God's incredible word, the Bible, books of prophecy. Now, you don't know all of the answers, but you're just making a choice tonight to choose to rest your future in God's hands. And you'd like to say, God, my eternal security is in you. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to come to these meetings. I'm going to sign up there at the Discover Bible Tape, take those lessons tonight, review them, do whatever it takes. I'd like to invite you, ladies and gentlemen, take that card right now and your response card. I want to go through it with you. If you'd mind putting your name and address and give us some information there. But notice the first one. I want to prepare for Jesus' soon coming kingdom. I hope everyone will check that first one. 
And then number two, perhaps you'd like to check this as well. I would like to surrender my life to Jesus and accept him as my Savior and Lord. Check that if you'd like to have that as your commitment tonight. And then number three, there may be someone here in uh, these various locations who would like to say, you know, I came in here, but I've wandered away from my Lord, but I'd like to desire to come back into his truth. Would you just check that third response? And then number four, there may be individuals here tonight that you're just guests or you're, you're, you've got something heavy on your heart, a burden, and you have a prayer request. Just write it down there. Our staff tomorrow morning will be gathering to pray for your request by name. Just make those checks right now, and when you finish that, would you take that container and pass it back down the aisle, return your pencils and your commitment card as I continue to pray. Lord, I don't know these people, but you know them, every one. I want to thank you for each commitment. Bless each one with inner peace tonight. What's next? We don't know. But we've made the big decision. We want to be part of your soon coming kingdom. Help us get ready in Jesus' name. Amen. Joey, sing the rest of that song for us. Don't cling to the world and its treasures. This earth will soon pass away. Oh, give him your love without measure he's calling you today are you ready for Jesus to come are you faithful in all that you do have you fought a good have you stood for the right? Have others seen Jesus in you? Are you ready to stand in your place? Are you ready to look in his face? Can you look up and say, people said amen. amen ladies and gentlemen if you didn't get one of those cards see one of our row captains but be sure you place those back in the containers place them down at the other end of the row tomorrow night why so much suffering invite your friends we'll see you here same locations all across america and australia and south america canada the islands of the sea thank you for coming Good night, and remember as you go, as we say at the end of our broadcast every single day, remember, friend, God really does love you. <laughs>